So by now you should have a simple modern UI with all the core features of your project implemented. But one small problem, none of the buttons do anything. So in this video, we're going to be connecting the dots and integrating our interface with our application's secret source. We'll start by making some minor fixes to our core.py file. When we tested the split PDF function earlier in the series, everything seemed to be working fine, right? While the function does technically work as expected, it's only because we unintentionally created a global variable. If you look closely, you'll find that the argument passed a PDF reader is file path, instead of the intended variable PDF path. The function still works when we debug as a script, as prior to the split PDF call, we initialize the variable file path, which has global scope, allowing the program to run without any issues. Therefore, to fix this issue, all we need to do is update the variable path to the constructor. After this, we'll add one more error check to make sure that the arguments received are both path objects, and then we'll add full stops to the end of our error messages for consistency. Next we'll move into alert.py. Here we want to add a boolean parameter for bell, which allows us to control whether the alert window will play a bell sound on creation. We then add a call to bell just above grab set. Now switch into split.py. Here we need to add imports for path, file dialog, our core split PDF function, as well as our alert top level. Now we'll scroll to the bottom of the file and start defining a function named select input file. Inside this function, we first need to request that users provide a path for the input PDF. And lucky for us, there's a pretty elegant solution. If we use the ask open file name function from the file dialog module, our app will create a file selection dialog using the native file explorer of the user's operating system. I'll show you what this looks like later in the video. After this, we just need to check whether the path is empty, which occurs if the user closes or cancels out of the dialog and set our input path label to an empty string. If the user does select a file, we convert it into a path object to correctly display backslashes on Windows systems and forward slashes on Unix systems such as Mac and Linux. Just note that when we assign a path variable to the text attribute of a label, the label will maintain a reference to that variable and uses its string representation to determine what is shown on screen. However, when we attempt to retrieve this value again using cget, it will actually return the path object itself and not a string. We now create an analogous function for output directory selection and use the ask directory dialog instead. I'm sure you want to see what the program looks like with these two functions integrated. So we'll jump back to our browse buttons, remove the placeholder text, and add command arguments to them which call their respective functions. An important thing to remember is that the command keyword argument used into Kinter widgets requires a function pointer, which is not the same as a function call statement. For example, command equals self.select input file, which has trailing parentheses, will not work. However, if you remove the parentheses, it will. The biggest drawback of this is that you can't pass any arguments to the command function. To make life simple, I advise using lambda functions, which effectively return a pointer to a function containing only a single line. Inside this single line, you can type any expression you want, including calls to other functions. Want to add an argument to your function call? No problem, just type it in like you normally would. There's also one more massive advantage to using Lambda functions, and if you stick around, I'll show you how it can save us from having to shuffle around code. Speaking of shuffling, if you shuffle your scroll wheel down, you'll find the like button. Now the reason why I decided to create this series was because I spent the better part of three months from December 2022 to February 2023 developing and releasing a Python program. I won't link it because I'm not trying to sell you something. While the original intention of this project was a learning exercise, I thought I'd document the process so I'd know what to do if I came across a brilliant idea in the future. Then I stopped for a second and thought about the fact that there are probably a lot of other people just like you who want to do the same thing, sell a piece of software. It's infinitely scalable and costs virtually nothing to maintain. So I thought, hey, why not turn this into a series? Which brings us to my one request. If you've enjoyed what you've seen so far, the single best thing you can do to help me support other developers just like you is click the like button. If you did, I'm truly grateful and I hope you have an awesome day. Now back to the video. With our browse buttons linked up to commands, we can now debug the program to see what the dialogues look like. Not too shabby if you ask me. The only button left to integrate is our action button. Create another function at the end of the split.py file named process file. In this function, we first want to retrieve our path objects from our labels and then check whether they are empty strings. If they are, we create an alert to notify the user. Otherwise, we move on to processing the input PDF. As a callback to what we discussed earlier, these arguments are already paths, so we don't need to convert them again. If the split PDF function fails due to an error we handle in the core.py file, we simply create an alert which displays the error message on screen. The last thing we need to do is trigger the bell for the main app window, change our button text to success and the color to green, and then set a 5 second timer which reverts the button to its original state. Bear in mind that in these alerts we use self.app to reference our root application. However, we also could have used the winfo top level value directly if we didn't choose to save the root app as an instance variable. After we link the action button to this function, we can debug the program again and the main interface should now be fully functional. To wrap things up, all we need to do is link our menu items to their respective commands. In menu.py, import the app submodule and activate top level. We'll then add the app class as a type hint for our master attribute to make access accessing widgets in our app easier with IntelliSense. 
Moving down to the input file option, if we start writing the command keyword argument and attempt to access the split frame attribute of our app, you'll find that the autocomplete suggestions have no idea what we're talking about. Seems pretty weird, right? But if you swap over to app.py, you'll see that we actually initialized our menu before we defined split frame. Hence, in menu.py, if we try to reference split frame, the attribute literally doesn't exist at this point in the startup process. Enter lambda functions. I hinted at it earlier, but this is the exact scenario where lambda functions save us from having to reorganize our code. If you start off with lambda, and then try to access split frame, autocomplete works like a charm. Just remember to end your function call with parentheses. Likewise, in the output directory option, we add a corresponding split frame function call. For the exit option, we call the application's quit function to terminate the main loop of the Tikinta UI, gracefully shutting down the app. And then in the activate item, we create an activate top level. And we're done. From an aesthetics point of view, this is what the final product looks like. We're now ready to start looking into how we can package our app for distribution, starting with piracy protection. If you enjoyed the video and want more content just like this, consider subscribing. And if you're ready to start protecting your application's source code from pirates, click this video. Until next time.